The last one, and then we can do some uh, rant. We, we can, you can tell me an entity, and if I've got a slide, I'll show you, or I'll pull some stuff, whatever you want. You guys paid for six hours of time. You're going to get it, okay? <laughs> Every last drop. I'm running on fumes here. I'm almost out, but I, I'm going to go. Okay. The <laughs> subcutaneous trunk mass in an adult. I don't even remember what this, what this case was. Oh, that one. Yeah. Well, this is a tumor I still have not fully wrapped my head around. And I, I kind of suspect it's because we don't really know yet how to wrap our head around it. So the, the reason I want to show this again is, and this is maybe the most challenging case in the whole series, because it, I don't know how to teach this, because it shows so many different things. And perhaps that's one of the clues. When I see all these different disparate morphologies, I think about this tumor. Um, uh, this is five slides, all from the same mass, OK? Here we've got kind of uh, cells that are in short fascicles with prominent collagen in the background. There may be some scattered, slight pleomorphism, like a little bit larger cells, but not dramatic uh, hypercellular atypia. This is not as atypical as that last case I showed you. This is a hypocellular. But the je flu, right? Plump, juicy. I also say juicy. I don't know if it's right, but. One of my students said, what does juicy mean? And I was like, je flu. It means fat, plump, OK? Uh, you know, in pathology, we use lots of classic words to describe how things look. But sometimes those classic descriptions don't work with my brain. I'm like, that's not chicken wire. I like to complain about chicken wire, because people say, chicken wire vessel. Do you guys know what chicken wire is? Do they have such a thing in France? It's a metal you know, fence. It should be perfect hexagons in a repeating pattern. I've never seen any tumor have perfect. I'm a very concrete thinker. That's what my psychiatrist wife says. I'm, I'm not very good at abstract thoughts. I'm a very concrete. It should look exactly like it says. So I've never seen chicken wire anything. So, so you, sometimes it's OK to defy the classic tradition of how something was taught, and find the word that works for your brain. And that's why I like to use lots of different descriptions in case one resonates with you. And that's something Mark Edgar, again, my mentor, he did the words he used to describe morphology. I was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. It, it resonated with my brain. So when I teach, I try to use lots of different words in hopes that one of them will, will click with your neurons. OK, so here, same tumor again. Now we've got. Some inflammatory cells in it. We've got some fat entrapped at the edges. Bundles of kind of ropey. Look at that wavy. See? Ramen noodles. Ramen noodles. That's collagen. It's not neural, but it gives you that neural feel, OK? Makes it seem neural. Here's an area that was more uh, mixoid. Uh, and unfortunately, I apologize for the section, but this area showed the fat trapping the best. I mean, that is like the fat trapping you see in dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, right? Morphologically, this tumor doesn't quite fit for dermatofibrosarcoma. The cytology, to me, is, is too plump. Usually. Dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans has very thin, very stretched out, thin cells. So here's the fat entrapment. Here, look at those fascicles, kind of almost a herringbone or chevron. Uh, chevron? Chevron? Chevron. OK. Uh, pattern a little bit, and a mixoid background, perivascular collagen hyalinization. That area does look quite like a neurofibroma, right? kind of slightly curved or buckled or S-shaped cells with delicate mixoid and collagen in the background. And then there we've got collagen bundles. I mean, all of these different morphologies in the same tumor is so crazy. And that area looks almost fibrohistiocytic, right? Plump histiocytoid cells and a slightly swirled and storyform backgrounds. 
Same thing there with prominent lymphocytic infiltrate in this area. And then here with some scattered pleomorphism, okay? And I don't unfortunately have the um, immunohistochemical slides for this case, but what it had was an unusual combination. It was um, positive for CD34, had patchy but real expression of S100. And now remember, S100 staining scattered rare cells in the background, that's not positive. That's background dendritic cells, which you're gonna find in almost any tumor, especially in inflamed tumors or skin tumors. And sometimes those cells, Langerhans cells and other dendritic cells can be so abundant that people will see them and think that it's a tumor that's S100 expressing. I've seen people mistake things as melanoma because of prominent dendritic cells in the background. But a key there is if you do SOX10, it goes away, right? So here, there was real tumor staining for S100, but SOX10 was negative, which argues pretty strongly against a neural tumor or an lanocytic tumor. So putting all of this together, one tumor that has this mixture of features is a relatively new group of tumors that have been referred to as NTREC rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. And so this is an emerging entity, which means the story is not yet finished and will probably evolve. And I imagine that some of the things that fit into this category will eventually develop their own unique names and we'll have probably several tumors that come out of this background. Is it maybe a bit of a wastebasket right now, but, but not totally. There are tumors that have been described, some of the tumors described as lipofibromatosis-like neural tumor. Lipofibromatosis has herringbone-like pattern of fascicles and fat entrapment, and people have described tumors that looked like that and had a neural appearance and S100 expression. And so some of those uh, seem to fit now into this NTREC category. And, and there have been a range of features ranging from low-grade tumors, which appear to behave in a benign, indolent fashion, to ones that are very atypical and look like sarcoma, and those seem to behave like sarcomas. So it seems like in these tumors, we don't have, they, their behavior is based on their morphology. If they look low-grade, probably it will behave well. If they look high-grade, probably it will act like a sarcoma regardless of the fact that it has an NTREC abnormality, okay? So you can use the pan-TREC um, immunohistochemical stain as kind of a screening test for these because they can have abnormalities of NTREC 1, 2, or 3, and then you can proceed to do molecular testing if needed to try to subcategorize these. The reason it's important to know is, number one, they're tumors that otherwise I would look at and say, I don't know what this is. So now when I see a spindly tumor with any of these features and I see some CD34 and S100, then I think, ah, maybe it's NTREC. So sometimes I'll stain for it and I don't find it, but I try to look for it now that I know it's, um, it's out there. And uh, the other thing is that because we now know that there are drugs that can be used to target some of the NTREC fusions, targeted therapies, that when we have one of these that is in the malignant end of the spectrum, knowing about this may be helpful in, in defining a targeted therapy uh, drug. So um, again, this is a tumor that I'm only uh, teaching about because of I've seen a couple of them and I'm looking for them, but I am not an expert on this tumor. I don't know, there are some people who may be, but I am not. But I wanted you to be aware of it since it's a new and evolving entity that's out there. And I, I definitely think they're hard to wrap your head around because they have such a wide range of morphologies. And I, I suspect, again, it's because probably this is not just one pure entity. Uh, do you have, you know a lot about NTREC? Is this something you've encountered? Um, or no? I, I, mean, I don't do much soft tissue, but I work a lot on NTREC uh, tumors. And what is interesting is the pattern of staining is very complex and can be sometimes associated with the subtype of uh, fusion partners. Mm -hmm. For example, Myo5A uh, will be different from ETV6. Uh, in terms of one will be nuclear, ETV6 uh, and track three will be nuclear. You can have different patterns of staining that is going into complexity because it's going to be the five prime partner of the fusion is going to be different and uh, there's lots of possibilities and the type of staining 
can be uh, in the, in the morphology of the tumor. For example, for Spitz tumor that have a myo5a in track three fusion, they will have they will look like uh, schwannomatous tumors and have a cytoplasmic stain. And ETV6 in track three will have more uh, epithelioid cytology and have a nuclear stain. So I think there's lots of uh, things to discover. And in track, what is really interesting is that they they uh, have sometimes very different morphology, even in the melanocytic group for NTRAC3, the example I gave. Interesting. So there's, there's going to be a, a growing level of complexity with the sub-partner differentiation. So. It's, uh, so that's kind of a, like with ALK, right? With ALK1, the different staining patterns sometimes indicate a certain you know, fusion partner, I guess. So that is also Interesting. true with ALK. For example, there are some partners that are systematically negative by IHC. Ah. For example, I, this is something I, I will uh, try to publish, but uh, I have some cases that are always the same partner and always negative. So these are oh, false cool. negative by IHC. That you that you need to do with uh, they have the same more they have maybe slight diff different morphology but not that much so there's a lot of complexity linked to the partners that will make headaches probably to people because this is really getting into uh, uh, another level of complexity uh, with all the different partners. so while you have the microphone let me ask you how often do you see tumors that are uh, N track rearranged, but that are negative on pan track stain. Is pan track a very sensitive screen for so, track fusions or N track fusions, or are there some that are negative? So, because um, I've only had it for a short time, so I don't have so much experience with it yet. I, I don't know if it if it, this is also the, for soft tissue, but N track one usually is so strong you do not need to put the slide under the microscope to uh -oh. see it's positive. Okay. In, in track three, you always have to look very um, uh, carefully because they can have some background light stain, and I will go to fish confirmation, and many times it will not be confirmed that have this weak staining. Uh, this is probably also linked that uh, the pigmentation can have uh, induced this weak staining, so that is oh, some okay. complexity that is li linked to melanocytic tumors that maybe you don't have in soft tissues. So uh, these antibodies are not easy to, to and you, and I, I think, I say to people, if you have only the antibody, but you don't have the fish, you, sometimes you're going to end up in a position where it's going to be complex because you're not going to be able to finalize your uh, vision of the molecular status of the tumor. Yeah, so far I've used the Pantrek as a screen with the idea that if it's positive, I'll send it out to do molecular to prove what it is. But I was wondering how, how good of a screen it is in practical usage. So I'll have to do some more reading and, and see over time. I, I mean, I think that just like with any immunostain, you read and you learn what the literature says it's supposed to do. And then in real life practice, sometimes there's more nuance, right? Stains are the very best and most specific the first day that they're published. And then things, you know, come closer to reality, I think, over time, right? As we get, even stains that I've published where I really liked it at first, as I've used it over the years, I've thought, well, I've seen exceptions. I've seen times it didn't work as well, or it was harder to interpret than I had, had hoped for. And, you know, it's just a tool, right? Just like molecular right? is a tool that helps us to sort out things. But in the end, we have to critically think about these cases. So, so be on the lookout for this and, um, and consider that this next time you see a unusual uh, uh, tumor that has kind of neural features and S100 positive, SOX10 negative. And Trek, thank you for your comments, Arnaud.